everyone and welcome to another episode of From the Lighthouse. I'm Stephanie and I'm here today with my co-host Michelle. Hi Michelle. Hi Stephanie. And we have wrangled our excellent producer into the studio today. So hi Jimmy. Hi Steph. Um, and the reason that we've um, all brought, um, come together today is to discuss a TV show that we all recently watched. Um, and it's a TV show based on a novel by Margaret Atwood and that TV show is Alias Grace. Um, I shamelessly bullied Michelle and Jimmy into watching this show. Because, she did. Yes. It was, <laughs> yes. I watched it first and it was so great that I felt that we needed to talk about it. So I did some I am forever bullying. grateful to you, Stephanie. I have excellent taste, don't I? You do. You do. <laughs> so I might start with Jimmy just because he's so infrequently here with us and I feel like <laughs> being mean to him. Great. Um, if you could start with, what did you like about Alias Grace? Well, first of all, I think it's, um, I was really surprised at how complex it was by the end of, of, of the series because I wasn't quite sure where um, it was going to take me and that's one of the things I really loved about the series that it was constantly surprising me with uh, its storylines um, and then by the end of it um, and I would love to actually hear your, your take on it I wasn't quite sure what to make uh, of it because I think I might not be the right target audience I mean I loved it because of its complexities but looking at it I thought oh, well I'm not quite sure I understand what the series was aiming to do um, from that perspective because the way I've read it is that it really complicated or comp uh, made complex this idea of what it really means to be a woman. Mm -hmm. um, and in a way, it sort of prefaced it with that wonderful introduction she gave uh, where she you know, talked about, you know, who is she? Uh, was she a, a criminal, a saint, an angel, you know, mm -hmm. all these things. And then by the end, it almost seemed to answer the question that she is actually all of them. Yeah. Um, she's all of them and none of them at the same time. Uh, and that, I just thought, wow, that, that was a really interesting way to, to look at the idea. Uh, and then there was a lot of biblical references, a lot of mm -hmm. mythological references that I just absolutely loved as well. Uh, but, yeah, we, what, what did you guys make of the the ending? Well, we should, we should preface this by saying <coughs> that the show, and I should have started with this, actually, is that the show is about a murder that takes place mm. in 19th century Canada. It is based on a real murder, but oh, obviously, it? yeah. Um, but obviously this is a creation. The novel was written by Margaret Atwood and it is quite open-ended as well. So what did you make? Look, I think my favourite element of, of and, the, and the one that I felt sort of best held it together and allowed me this way of thinking through the incredible complexity was the Scheherazade. Yes. Mm. Um, and especially because uh, you've got that wonderful, uh, I guess, infinite regr regress that, step, that sets up with the stories being told mm. uh, and, and the letter, the final letter being written and, and, and then just that notion of stories telling stories telling stories. Mm. Uh, and, and, and I think for me, uh, you know, the, the sort of the enigmatic nature at the heart of it was brilliantly done because for me it, it was a way of evading all of the labels mm. that women are constantly being asked to fit into yes so in a sense I think at, at the very heart of it was that idea that of course when all of these labels have largely originated out of patriarchal structures mm. or you know sort of societies built around men why would why would one of them fit mm -hmm. and and who does fit into something and and what is it to be anyone mm -hmm. what does endure out of us is there a constant self that yeah. you know sort of is there from day one are you still um you know if you commit a crime are you still guilty 10 years later 15 years later mm -hmm. when that self can't be anything like the self at the time of the crime yes. you know so so i i think that for me made it absolutely just gripping well, the thing that kind of worked that, that um, for me that kind of buddies off that point is the um, the patchwork that she's constantly working on and the sewing. So, I mean, mm. obviously the sewing is there to represent um, on a kind of simple level, like the constant work that she does. You know, it, it struck me when I was watching this that she's always working. You know, you see the life of a servant. She's mm. down on the floor cleaning. She's sewing. You can't be idle as a woman. Right, and then also the patchworks that she's making, the patchwork quilts that she makes and, and, and displays at the end, uh, is a collection of stories really, because it's a collection of all of these different little pieces of of material that have been kind of fit together, and that to me is just represents her because she's putting together all of these stories um, in what she's telling both Dr. Jordan 
and also what she's telling us that there is no kind of one right story. There's just all of these stories that she's putting together in order to, as you say, Michelle, get around the fact that none of the roles, the social roles for women, none of the labels fit. Yeah, look, and, and I think one of the other things that, that struck me with, you know, sort of the, 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 the patchwork motif and, and the marvellous thing about Atwood is that you never have to hesitate in going where you think mm. because you know that if you've thought it, she's thought it before yeah. you. Mm. And right. when you think in terms of um, the way that that patchwork motif opens up, sort of thinking through the muses, the three muses, mm. and, and that sort of weaving of destiny and fate, mm. because, of course, that introduces another element to it, because when you look at the circumstances, and, I mean, she's so political in many respects, not just in terms of, um, you know, sort of the most immediate feminist um, sort of element of the story, but also in terms of class and in terms of migration and in terms of Canada. You know, when you mm. look at all of those sorts of things... Um, she's not afraid of throwing into the mix, you know, sort of the way our notions of of of, of fate um, and 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 what might be destined are also woven into the fabric mm. of the lives that we lead. Mm. And it also connects her, I think, to the uh, to the history of uh, depictions of women in, in particular. I was thinking, you know, not just simply of, of the fates, but also of the, the myth of Arachne. Mm. You know, there's that um, wonderful. Uh, myth with uh, Athena and Arachne doing this weaving competition and they're just telling one set of story and reversing or you know uh, contrasting that opposing set of stories so it's almost like this battle between these two women telling these stories uh, about each other in a way because Athena is telling a story about the gods uh, and Arachne is undermining that story by telling the, uh, the bad things the gods are actually doing yeah. at the same time so there's this wonderful motif of storytelling that's sort of been woven throughout the entire thing and uh, for me that that was part of the complexity I wasn't quite sure by the end of it um, which story could be considered um, you know if you're kind of like me looking for that truth or truthful story where does the truth lie in all of those different stories well I think that's the point Mm. there is none Um, and you know even at the end when we've listened you know this is a six episode series and so we've we've gone through and watched five episodes and and right at the end in the last episode she says to Dr Jordan I I I massaged my story and and pushed it in the direction that I thought you wanted Mm, to hear and so I don't think the series is at all interested in truth I think Mm. the story the, the series and the book is interested in the way that she constructs these stories and especially the construction of these stories as an act of resistance Mm. because, as she says right from the beginning in that first kind of really close-up on her face, on Grace Marks's face, um, the the kind of point is that she's been labelled, as Michelle says, with all of these kind of inadequate labels and she's Mm. been pushed into this box and this box. And there is no kind of way for women at the time to construct a kind of... um, identity of their own and so she her act of resistance is telling people what they want to hear mm. i suppose i was coming from it uh, at it from a more crime fiction perspective because yeah. i want to know who the criminal is yeah. i want to know whether she actually did commit the crime or you know was it um a case of uh, she became schizophrenic and there's a splitting of personality uh, or was that a put on or was that a put on mm. that she did just to you know sell these men the stories that they want to yeah. to hear you know I, I found that scene at the end very disturbing actually when she's telling her husband uh, about the, the her suffering because she kind of gets the feeling that he gets off on, on that. It, yeah. And I was thinking, oh, geez, that, 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 that's, that's quite a dark territory too. But isn't that like so many stories about like, you know, women as the kind of suffering, mm. you know, silently suffering through life kind of um, motif, you mm. know, that, that idea that women should kind of quietly suffer. Um, and that's their lot as women. And we, we, you know, we look at them and go, you poor little darling, now you're safe. Yeah, you know, but, but I suppose you know, for me, the disturbing part was that we actually get off on that idea of you know oh, the erotics the, the, of, the, the of erotics listening of to stories yeah. of of in actual fact um, sadistic violence yeah. Yeah. against women because that's what he's getting off on, isn't mm. it? It's the fact mm. that she's no doubt been violated, break, you know, raped, yeah. tortured, all of those sorts of things. And, and the show and, hints yeah. towards that. And well, like, I don't think I can. I think it's more than hinting. <laughs> it's yeah. kind of yeah. explicit. But I also wonder um, I, the way that in the this, this sort of the centrality of the storytelling and the absolute lack of any form of, um, you know, sort of solid 
uh, answer. Mm. You know, we actually get this sort of wonderful inkling of how so much of the foundations that our society rest on are actually on sort of electable things, you know, things mm. that, that cannot be, when we look at that story, um, where there's the impossibility of, of locating a truth, a truthful event, you know, somebody, a, a villain, a this, a that, then mm. we end up with a society that's sort of floating on, on, a, on a very unstable base. And we get that lovely flip where what you're left with is just how um, receptive and, and, and impotent and passive the, the, the men have been, mm. you know, because they're literally receiving, um, you know, the, the, these stories and are in some sense impotent in the face of them because there is no getting to the bottom well, of them. Well, they're destroyed by the story in certain cases. So um, Dr. Simon, by the end, uh, was basically almost brain dead mm. uh, in part because of the, the story. Um, the impact it's had on his life. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and then, then on the opposing side, you've got her, her husband, Jamie, who gets off on the story because um, I was talking to my um, housemate as we watched this together about it and he was saying, you know, look, it's, it's a very negative portrayal of men mm. uh, in particular. And I said, look, uh, most most of it is, but there was one character that I thought was in a way her equal, her match, uh, a male character, and that was um, the, the peddler, I forgot his name. Jeremiah. 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 Mm. Yeah, he was quite an interesting, complex character in himself because he aids her. He, he knows something and he's uh, actually deliberately helping her uh, and she's also helping him so they're almost like keepers of each other's secrets in a way um, and I thought that was quite an interesting idea there was this match between the, the two of them that uh, yeah I was I mean I, I agree and, and I found him of you know sort of a, a, a very um, attractive character in many respects but then I also I have to say that the, I did find myself just having this sort of moment when he turns up at the door mm. And in, in that particular sort of scene where he's, you know, walked in as the doctor and, and I, I did just, I, it was the only bit where I just felt a little bit uh, sort of rickety as, mm. or the, the coincidence factor or the this or the that. It was the only moment in there that I, I just, I, I wasn't 100% well, I think that's, lost in the, in the story. Um, I think that may have to do with how much you bought into the whole um, mysticism uh, storyline of it. So, so there is an aspect of, of the story that deals very much with the mystical or with the supernatural. You mm. know, so did um, uh, Mary, uh, you know, possess um, Grace, and did Jeremiah could, could she could he actually see into the future? So you bought that he could actually see into the future. Then you bought that you know he he deliberately in a way set himself up to help her in that situation because you know when he read her palm he said you know that uh yeah you're going to go through a lot of issues but it will work out in the end you know that was his prediction uh, and in a way he's trying to make that possible make that work so it just depends on i suppose how much you you really wanted to buy into that mystical side of the story i did find that a little bit problematic because i wasn't quite sure how to read that and i think the that that was part of the complexities of the series you could read it either way you could read mm. it as a realistic story or as a part supernatural story at the same time well you don't really know what's going on with jeremiah no. do you i mean so that's i think again part of the show's resistance to giving you answers yes. like you don't know what is actually transpiring because, with him and what yeah. the nature of their kind because of his predictions do come true you know he, he does say things about people and they it does happen but, but do they come true or do they make it come true because there's that open mm. question when she you know they're eating the apple yes. and um, mary breaks the um skins yeah, yeah. and that signifies that she won't get married mm. but whereas grace um throws the apple mm. um skin and the apple peel and it says that she'll marry somebody yeah. whose name is jay now is that is, like did is, that actually did happen? That, is that actually a prediction or is yeah. that a you know when you give somebody a prediction and then they kind of because of that mm. kind of conviction that this will happen, they make it happen. Well, the other part I was also thinking about was, um, did that actually happen or did Grace invent that to fit the yeah, story? Yeah, exactly. Is it even to... true? Yeah, did that exactly. Even happen? So, yeah. so I, I think that, that was my, uh, uh, by the end of it, I thought I went, I have no idea what's going on because everything could in a way be fictitious. You know, yeah, she, I mean, how She is, could be yeah. Scheherazade just weaving this continuous story yeah. and we as the audience are reading it in a particular way saying, well, I like that story, so I'm just going to... 
And also, that that there's story. no coincidence that no, they're no. all Jeremiah, James, Jamie. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. It, it they're is, all Jays. Yeah. I mean, they're all Jays. So if any man she's going to marry is going to yeah. be <laughs> Jay. Yeah, but like she could be there saying, okay, so this, you know, we have a societal kind of mm. bias of women and witches and, mm. you know, women's supposed alignment with the supernatural. So I'm going to feed him this, this, this story about, you know, this one day when we did this um, magic kind of um, premonition trick um, mm. and so therefore it'll make it seem a little bit more glamorous and it'll make you know Mary seem more tragic because mm. she'll have been fated to die and it'll make me seem more interesting etc so we, that could be um, a thing too but um, another thing I was thinking of as you were talking is maybe this is like a critique of the crime fiction genre as a whole yeah I was just about to say yeah. you know, the only audience that it doesn't satisfy are the crime fiction audience yeah but I mean maybe that's like her mm. point you know we read these salacious stories we read these stories about murder and death mm. and violence and usually Right. Um, in crime fiction, the victim is a woman. We do have one mm. female victim here, although we do have a male victim as well. Mm. Um, and we see her being... we have two female victims. Yeah, that's yeah. right, yeah. So we see her being brutalised. We see all of this terrible stuff happening to women, mm. most of it sexual, um, but as well actual mm. physical violence. Um, and we, we enjoy it and we want to know the truth. And instead we're going to sh- give you a cr- what looks on the surface and sort of sets itself up to be this crime story. And then just pull the rug out and say, well, what do you actually want in a crime story? Why do you, why mm. do you want this? And how can you be so certain in your, in your kind of wrapping up a crime story with that mm. idea of this is the immutable truth? Because for a while there I was actually even thinking uh, whether this was a play on the mystery of Marie Roget. Mm. With, with Mary's death, because there was a, a, a very strange parallel happening there. Because I thought, was Marie meant to be Marie Roget of you know post story? Yeah. Because Marie Roget, um, as those who, who know anything about the story, you know, did die of a botched abortion job. Yeah. As well, so I thought, you know, is she sort of playing off that idea, or again, is she sort of weaving that story into fit with uh, maybe that critique of? The, of crime fiction I think that you're talking about. There. Margaret would so learn it, I don't think those mm. illusions would be mm. accidental. Yeah. 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 No, and, and I think there's also that thing in, in crime fiction where once again you want the order to be restored through justice. <laughs> and what you see is that, because, I mean, obviously one of the possibilities, you know, is that she actually did cold-bloodedly murder them. You know, that, that's certainly one of the possibilities that exists all the way through from beginning to end. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I think at the very least she's an accessory. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. she could have been... Whether it was coercion, yeah. whether it was whatever it was. I mean, mm. one of those possibilities. And, and I think that the, the two things that you... Well, the, the two things that you see by the end is that even as um, perpetrator of a crime like that um, is justice served by the type of um, prison... That she attended by the, the mm. this by the that, yeah. and and also once again, um, it is this this terrifying notion of the mutability of, of character, mm. you know. So that that um, because I think one of the things that was so attractive about her, um, you know, that that drew the reader to her was the fact that, in actual fact, whether she was guilty or not, I wanted her to be free. Yeah. Um, and and I th- and I think that is that is what she's asking us to wrestle with is mm. you know ca- ca- is is human nature something that um, you know you can you can pin down and, and hold constantly uh, responsible when we're so shifting and we're so many things mm. you know yeah. so if one part of us does this particular thing is all is the whole um, you know especially given the when you look at uh, the society that she's living in, when you look at the injustices that, uh, you know, you feel so palpably um, because of the remoteness of that society where, you know, on one hand, we imagine that it's impossible to, um, you know, to, to just box people so absolutely. Well, you know, you're from a lower class, so it's absolutely fine for your every waking hour to be spent serving. I mean, if that seems Im- impossible to um, to inflict upon a whole set of people coming from today, except that you know as soon as you say those words, in actual fact, it's exactly the same thing. It just might not be based on class. It might be based on economics. 
um, race. Yeah, or, or race, ex- exactly. So, um, you, you know, when, when you, depending on the frame that you take, the crime becomes more or less, and especially because I think the backdrop of just, you know, sort of firstly the uprising led by, I can't remember the, 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 the oh, no, the one no, that she's talking the, about. The, yep, yeah, the, the, one that Mary, the, yeah. the one that Mary is talking about. Yeah. And also the absolutely um, vile retribution that followed in terms of farms being burnt, you know, mm. women, children killed, slaughtered, you know, that sort of violence. Mm. And that violence is 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 represented as, as you know endemic to society. You know we have the violence of the uprising and the way that the uprising was was um, put down, and that's an interesting kind of look at the politics of of, of Canada. Um, but then we also have the like implied sexual violence, which is just a part of every woman's life. You know, yeah. you look at her mother, and she's got this terrible husband, and she's got all of these children, and she's dying on the boat, and she has this terrible um, life. And then you look at um, the way that there's an assumption that if, when you're a servant in a master's household, you will be raped. Yeah. It's just a matter of time. And it's your fault. It's your fault, yeah. right? And if you get and if you get pregnant, it's your fault. And if you um, have an abortion and you die because of the abortion, it's also your fault. And you can't expect anything better than that. And so you just have to kind of go along with it. You know, in this kind of world of, of like horrendous sexual violence, you know, what else is, what other options are there for somebody like Grace? She either, you know, accepts sexual violence will always be her lot in life or she fights back. And so you find yourself thinking, I don't care if she did what well, I found myself thinking. I don't care if she murdered Nancy. I don't care if she murdered the um, Thomas Kinnear. I just want her to be free because I would probably murder them too. Yeah. <laughs> you well, know? But it's also the inconsistency in terms of the, the punishing of, of yeah. violence because some violence is absolutely condoned. Some violence is, 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 is implicitly allowed mm. or explicitly allowed. And then, of course, you know, you, you finish up with the figure of war mm. and mm. where the absolute condoned, the state condoned violence of one person leaves the doctor a vegetable, yeah, <laughs> you know, and, and yet there is no, so, so, so it's just the, I think she manages to really draw attention to the mm. way that there are horrible um, inconsistencies in the way as a society we treat uh, violence and we punish oh, yeah. some types of violence and and yet in in condone others. Yeah, well, I mean, when she's in the the um, psychiatric hospital, nobody's getting slash, punished for that. Yeah, exactly. So she's there because she's done a violent act or been accessory to a violent act or been involved in a violent act, whatever the however you allocate guilt. Um, but she's brutally beaten and raped, mm. right? And so they're there to punish violence, but they're inflicting violence. And you see the violence that is is part of the jail system, like when her captors take her to the um, the house where she's acting as a maid. Um, they, you know, twist her arm and all of this. So you're punishing violence by perpetrating violence. So it's state-sanctioned violence versus non-state-sanctioned violence. So it's it's a violent world. Yeah, and I mean, you can only imagine that uh, Atwood is uh, very au fait with Foucault. And I, I was yeah. actually just thinking of Hagseed mm. and, you know, sort of the, the, the way that she creates... Um, sort of a theatrical environment within the the prison mm. system. You know, you do, I think that that you do get this feeling of of of, of an intellect uh, deliberately turning over. Um, you know, a, a, what has become an, a, an absolute sort of foundation of 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 you know Western society, which is the prison. Yeah. Um, and that regulation of behaviour in yeah, the prison. Yeah. yeah. And and the rightness and and the the the, the you know sort of the it's very. I mean, you couldn't imagine going out and saying, "Well, I think we're just going to close down all the jails because it's just you know, yeah. <laughs> it's just, no, we're just not going to punish." That's that's right. You you know, it, it's just. But you can see this very great mind um, asking us to think critically about uh, you know, sort of something that is very much a, a, a basic part of um, you know yeah. contemporary society. Yeah, I mean, um, I was looking at it, I suppose, from see in terms of punishment. I think she was being punished far severe than whatever her crimes were and I think that's why by the end of it you do want to see her mm. release I was more interested from uh, I guess a a knowledge perspective I just want to know really you know what exactly her involvement was it wouldn't have made a difference whether I thought she should have been released or not by the end of it mm. but but for me it was just more knowledge you know like was she 
uh, was she perpetrator? Was she a uh, victim? Was the show she... doesn't want you to have and those the labels. Show doesn't, yeah. Exactly. And, and but, that but I think really... it's also that thing of knowledge. She's mm. actually asking us to question our knowledge. Do you, yeah. do you know what I mean? Yeah, because... I, I know what you mean, but I think, you know, when it does come to ideas, uh, when it does come to acts of crime, we have to know. We have to know exactly what a person's involvement is. But how can we ever know? Uh, well, the person should, in a way, know. Uh, yeah, but I, what I think... if the person? But how do you trust that the person? Is no, and, being that, and that's yeah, yeah. That, that's the part that's that's really problematic. Um, mm. Is she lying to us? Is she telling us the truth? By the end of it, I think you know, I wasn't sure whether she even knows what the the truth is anymore. It's, it's almost like her life has been built around telling these different stories. She is, she has in a way embodied Shahrazad by the end. Yeah. It's just a case of continually telling stories so people, so you know, the king doesn't chop her head off. Uh, to keep her alive, she just can, can, can uh, completely yeah. weave these stories over and over and over again. Uh, by the end, the, the truth becomes very, very obscure. Uh, I don't think there is a truth. Like I, I no. think the show really puts into doubt the the entire truth as a concept. Yeah, because I mean, in, in one flashback, she strangles Nancy, mm. uh, and in another flashback, he strangles. Nancy, so did she actually do? And the then in one they both do it. Yeah, and yeah. they both yeah. do it. And, and you're kind of, you know, I thought about it. Well, it it changes the way you look at the story depending on which mm. story you think is is the accurate story. Mm. If she was involved, or was she actually outside looking at that at the plant caterpillar? Yeah, yeah. and the plant. But even if she was, even if that is the like mm. quote unquote true version, she's involved. She knows it's going on. She knows it's going yeah. on, and that's that's my point. I think that. She is involved in the crime, but to what extent yeah. is she involved? That's yeah. what I'm interested in because that would then uh, impact the severity of her punishment. You now, know, she's, she's punished very severely regardless yeah. of how she's yeah, uh, involved, but the severity of it. Um, so is, she, is this a case of, in, of great or grave injustice or in a way just minor injustice? Or, or given, yeah, given, that... given what goes on in the asylum, I think mm. you know what, yeah. whichever w- yeah. way it goes yeah. on, it, it's it's still um... yeah. I think it's a definite critique of the mm. the prison environment, but in terms of her punishment as a character, you know, did she? I don't want to use the word deserve because it's, mm. no one really deserves that kind of thing. But you know, was it um, in a way justified by the story? You know, she killed somebody. She was. She she inflicted great violence on another person. I, I, do you know the thing I'm thinking mm. about? And I, I'm I'm thinking about um, I, I'm I, I'm thinking about knowledge, and and I guess I'm I'm thinking about all the different ways that we we sort of um, you know sort of think about knowledge, you mm. know, and and I'm thinking about carnal knowledge, mm. and and mm. the way that it's almost um, it, I I, th- I think. That it's giving, it, it's recognizing that we want to give knowledge a body, you know, that that makes it, um, you know, sort of solid. That makes it something that we can base, um, you know, sort of that we can we can base our interactions with our, our society on, and all of those sorts of things, as though it is, um, you know, sort of irrevocable, as though it's it's um, inviolable, as as though it is. And, mm-hmm. and I and I think that's why it's. It's so important to Atwood that we don't have access yeah. to that uh, that notion of knowledge as as uh, as a sort of inviolable body, which would happen if if we knew um, what actually happened. Do, do you know what I mean? Because we, we I, th- I think that's what she's asking us to think about. Because we do we don't just we we do make knowledge into a body and that means that there are things that um, aren't allowed into particular knowledges that don't count as knowledges that we do you know we're constantly doing things to work out you know sort of boundaries without acknowledging yeah and I think that's why you know it's interesting that um, we have the Dr Jordan character the doctor who's come in to kind of find this knowledge because I think that is is symptomatic of you know our societal kind of drive to find the truth and put it in a box and say okay we've dealt with that now you know we know the answer um, we've figured it out and so his failure to unearth that knowledge and to you know put her case away I think is really interesting. Yeah, and actually, I think that's where I just fall in love with Atwood again and again and again. Mm. Is because as much as I think she's resisting that notion of a, of, of 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 knowledge as, as as a body, as a foundation, as as something that we don't, you know, sort of question, challenge, and interrogate. 
I also think that in that moment of insight that the doctor has in terms of, I think it's well towards the end where he, he sort of just gets this this sort of wave of awareness of that in, in the face of the, the relentless abuse, in, in face of the, the, the lack of, you, you know, options in, in terms mm. of the absolute sort of powerlessness mm. of, of grace, but also of, I think he gets that inkling of, of the condition of, 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 of being a woman in, in, in that world. You can sort of see how in that willingness to, to sort of, um, I guess, in that willingness to learn, you know, in that willingness to be in, to inquire, to be critical, mm. to to not, um, you know, yeah. the, then you get that sense that knowledge is also not something that you just throw away and and, and, yeah. and just because it's difficult and it resists us, it's also not something that you just completely abandon. I think that was one of the problems I had with, with the series and the more I thought about it was that I just thought that he was punished too severely in his um, search for knowledge. Uh, you know, by the end, he, he ends his life as a vegetable um, forever stuck on this one case that he can't crack. But even he puts attempts to put a label on Grace. Like, for mm. almost immediately when he starts meeting with Grace, he starts mm. having these dreams or, you know, fantasies mm. about her as a sexual object. Yes. Right? So almost as soon as, as he meets her, he starts to construct her in a certain way. And she's playing into that in a very knowing way. And she mm. gets it. She knows that he's looking at her sexually almost mm. from the start. But that's why I think, um, again, Outwood is so clever because she doesn't let him off the hook, even though no. he might seem like this, you know, uh, he's searching for the truth, he's going to find it, he's, you know, searching for knowledge, he's pushing through the, the difficulties. Um, he, at the same time, has his own agenda. But also, when we when you sort of look through the causality of of him ending up a, a vegetable, essentially he le- ends up a vegetable because he goes out to war, mm. and part of his motivations for going to war is the fact that I think rather than sitting through what might be the consequences of all the things that he's been through, which would probably entail, the, you know, sort of the fact that he had in actual fact fallen in love with her, yeah, that he did desire her, that he did pretty much rape that woman and use her as as a as a terrible yeah. you know sort of outing you know sort of way of releasing his 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 pent up tension you know sort of rather than actually um you know sort of sitting with his experiences he ac- actually pushed them down and mm. you know sort of went off to war to distract himself yeah essentially so yeah i totally agree i i feel that there was a moment of 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 terrible insight for him where probably the you know sort of in understanding how powerlessness how powerless society was making women that in fact you know sort of society was inflicting a grave violence upon women that he was implicated in that he was implicated in yeah and that rather than sort of well you know sort of taking that moment as as a as a as a sort of a, a a, a wake up call or as a step towards you know something or anything you know any of the um you know sort of because he doesn't does he i mean he doesn't go well we've got to stop this or or you know let, let, let's go let's go back and um you know sort of apologize you know there, there's none of that he goes and he rapes somebody because mm. he, he can't cape cope with that realization mm. of of that and and then he goes off to um you know sort of participate in one of those ultimate um, you know, ultra patriarchal acts of war. Yeah, and then he's shot. So I, I think. But I it's... think he, he, he has a choice with that. I mean, that that was the American Civil War, wasn't it? Yeah, but I, I think given his condition, to... he, and also the keenness. You know, yeah. I, I I go. You know, I'm glad I've got the war to go. Well, to. in a way, he's glad because then it gives him a, a respite from thinking about her. Mm. Uh, and that's the other part that um, I was thinking about too, because she was very happy to play uh, the Eve character in in that. You know, she was happy to, in a way bring him down and seduce and destroy him because he lusted for her, uh, after her. Uh, and I thought, well, you know, is it really that wrong to desire somebody? No, but she knew what he was doing. She, yeah. and, uh, but, like, I don't think that she's punishing him for desiring her. No, no, but she was playing that. No, she was she, playing She was on. leading him through that fantasy that he was building up. She knew she that he was yet another man who was yeah. imposing his own script on her, I mm. think. And she knew straight away that he was coming there as this, like, I'm a heroic doctor who's going to sort out this unruly woman, right? He and was he was very going reluctant, to... though, mind you. Like, he, he, yeah, he, he, he didn't, was. He didn't want to be involved in this case. And he was actually the other, I mean, uh, that... The doctor, the, 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 the reverend, sorry. The reverend, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was the one that was pushing for this. And, yeah, and but he kept I... saying that, you know, I don't really think I, I can do this. 
Um, and he was really being forced into this role and forced to continue this lead. Yeah, but I think that what she was doing is she was resisting the way that both the Reverend and the Doctor mm. um, w- wanted to impose an answer or a, yeah. another label. Well, I, I suppose for me, yeah. I, I would I would feel that the Reverend was more um, culpable than that he was. I mean, he, he was so reluctant uh, and a part of me, mm. you know, I, I was very disappointed in him, you know, for, for that terrible rape scene that he did. I, I thought, oh, you know... But I just think, no, I, I'm less sympathetic to him because I think he's just another man who wants to put a label on him. Well, you see, see, this is where I think that actually I feel as though part of Atwood's strategy was to make him, because I actually found him an incredibly sympathetic character. I was very drawn to him. And, and I think that part of the enterprise of, of Alias Grace was the fact that, um, you know, what we ended up doing was, I, I mean, I ended up completely identifying with him. I, mm. I thought it was, and, you know, and, and, I, and, I, and I think um, this, is, this is where the story is, is, is so nuanced and so complex because uh, in that horrible scene where he rapes that woman, you know, and it is so, and you are so gutted, and you're so yeah, disgusted, and you're so disappointed. And it's clearly I, set up to be. That yeah, way. And, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. I was almost, I almost felt a sense of betrayal of his character that I thought, you know, oh, but, I could see it happening. But, like, you know, but it it's, it's tragic. It, it was it's tragic, a tragedy yeah. because what you see is you see characters who are forever alienated from each other from a situation mm. that will not allow them. Mm to escape the hierarchy that's there and that, that, that terrible oppressive quality of a situation where... Eve, because I think that's the thing, you know, of course there becomes something a little bit chilling about somebody who can play you so consciously, mm. you know, that, that can have, have reached a point of sort of dissociation to the point where you can actually just consciously play somebody's desires and all of those sorts of things of course there's something she, but then you also go well, what other what other choice does she have what other strategy is there for her other than victim you know so, so of course she gains agency through being able to manipulate yeah exactly sort of men and you understand that that's what she what she must do it's it's the option that's available yeah, I, to I her. think it's just my sense of uh the justice you know if she's going to punish men punish the men who have wronged her not punish but the isn't men he who, wronging her well, not like the prison men. Are but no, no, no. Is she but, actually but that's punishing him? Is she well, punishing it, it him almost feels him? like she's vicariously punishing him. He's, he seems to be standing for mankind because she can't get to the men she really wants to punish. But what I see like is... Like her father and... You know, no, I see it a bit differently. I don't see it as punishment. I see it as like this is yet another man who has come in and who is intent to ascribe significance or meaning on her story for her, right? Mm-hmm. So he's trying to figure out what this means, what this story means, where does she fit? What role has she actually had in the murder? And she's had that her whole life. She's had her father, her various employers, um, the men who've raped her. All of these people have tried to put her in little boxes and label her in the ways that women are labelled. And she's had the lawyers come and say, you've got to say this and not say this because that's what will play well in court. And he's yet another man who has mm. entered into her life yeah. and said, this is what your story means, and, but, but, and she's not going along with it. Yeah, I suppose that's the thing, because she did go along with it with all the other ones. But she didn't with him. She manipulates his story. Oh, whereas, has she been? Or has well, she been well, manipulating with, the whole time? Well, that's the thing. With the, with the lawyers, she did. You know, the lawyers told her, you say this. And, and so, so she, she did. She, she did say it. And then she got the, the Yeah, but that's, but that's that. playing along. But she plays along with what he wants too. She plays along with the lawyers mm. and she plays along with him because she knows that he's interested in her sexually almost from the start because of the way he responds to her and the way he responds to, like, virtue in distress. But, but also, I'm a, a virtuous woman who has been hard done by and you're going to feel sorry for me and I'm going to tell you all these terrible things that have happened to me over my life so that you feel sorry for me and then you can ascribe the meaning that you've decided on me. And also I think the thing is that, as and, you know, and particularly as a society because we, we're, we're actually sort of programmed, I think, in some way to read our sort of current sort of situation where you know benevolent doctor you know yeah um, yeah yeah. and and but of course the 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 thing that's very different in that situation is as well intentioned as he might be you know and and I think he actually as a character is is meant to be read as well intentioned as as trying Mm. to quest for some sort of you know sort of truth and getting to the bottom of things for a non you know sort of um punitive reasons and all of those sorts of things the situation he steps into is already um, is already one of, of hierarchy and and mm-hmm. oppression because whether or not um, do do you know what I mean? Yeah, so that I know, but, it's um, situ- I, I, but he has the ability to free her at that stage. 
And that's the part that really uh, rankled me because if his report was favourable, he would have freed her. Um, but she's playing into that. I just see, but, but I she see didn't, she, in a way, she, she destroyed that her, her ability to free herself at that stage. It came much later. Yeah, I know, but I think which that, I think is actually an interesting thing because it's a very it, interesting thing. Um, and and that's the because part what, that was the, the what was the motivation for that? Was she yes. smart enough? Yeah, to what, be you I think she was smart enough. How but does Atwood want us to read that? You know, I in, think in all the men of, are equally culpable. To be honest, I, I think he's as equally, even though he's set up initially as a sympathetic person, and we in our kind of you know scientific um, world, you know, rational world supposedly, um, we see the man of science coming in and we think, okay, we can. this is the man of science who's going to find the truth and we are set up to kind of relate to that and sympathise with that. But I think that all of the men are equally culpable. He's trying to impose his script on her. The reverend is trying to impose his script on her. Her husband is trying to, you know, impose his script on her. And she, what she is doing is the same strategy to every man. She's playing along with it insofar as it, as it helps her or gets her something or gives her agency. But she's playing them all. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. Look, I, I, and I, and I think you do have to ask yourself: is is that a point of defiance in in the fact that I would actually prefer to yeah, you know, go spiting, back to prison? Is she spiting herself? Because uh, at the end of it, she does say, you know, that, that she is she has got happiness by having a place of her own, a place where she can yeah, be she's being mistress. resistant through her story. Yeah, but mm. um, you know, she could have had that much earlier. Is the point that I was just yeah, trying to make? I guess. Yeah, you know, which is which that. is curious because yeah, is, why is, is not that a sort of a, aim for that? A, is is that a sort of was that a sort of a, an un, a sort of a self sabotaging mm. or, or or was it a as an act of defiance? But I, I still I just can't help feel, and I guess I have this sort of structuralist sense that you know there the, there are these sort of um, the, these oppressive hierarchies in place mm. and as long as structurally they exist as the organising um, l- logics of, of the society it doesn't matter you know and what the characters do because yeah, exactly no, yeah, yeah. because she's trapped exactly and he's trapped and, and he's they're trapped. all trapped and, mm. and so at the same time it's just tragic to watch these characters because I'm you're wanting the, yeah. the what could have been Mm. Well, I think it's about, for me, the, this whole series comes down to what stories we ascribe to women, what stories we're comfortable ascribing to women, what stories we're not comfortable ascribing to women. We are not comfortable, and I think you see that with the Reverend and all of the people who want to set Grace free. We're not comfortable with the idea of a woman who fights back, a kind of resistant, unruly woman. Um, we are comfortable with putting them in, you know, you are the servant, you are the, the mistress, you are the wife, you are... You know, the all of these kind of socially sanctioned script, scripts for women, she doesn't fit with them, right? But she knows about them and she plays on them. And if you think about today, we still ascribe all of these same stories to women. Do, do you know what I absolutely love? I absolutely love the way that she completely and utterly, um, you know, sort of in, in, she the, the way that Atwood completely and utterly, um, I guess, excised love. Mm. Because, you know, like when you think about it, uh, you, you know, sort of love as that notion that, you know, it, it, if Grace and the Doctor had, fall, you know, yeah, yeah, had yeah. fallen in love. And, and I think that that is in, in that sort of wonderful way of, of and, and in fact, although she ends up with um, Jamie and we had that uh, sort of uh, idyllic image of him making that crown for her in you know sort of on her birthday where you look at that and it's it's like this beautiful sort of notion of of budding love Mm. and innocence and and this you know sort of um prelapsarian um sort of moment in the garden in the in the garden Mm. um and and yet i think in in sort of refusing love its place there she's actually asking us to be critical of the way mm. that love functions, just as justice functions in exactly. its notion of consistency. Yeah. Do, do you I know love that, that point constant? because I think that's what she does when, when she shows you the marriage because Jamie has presumably fallen in love with her, and I'm doing air quotes here, um, but, like, he waits for her to get out of jail. He comes back and, gives her, you know, sets her up well, in he, his house. Well, it, it was his... Um, 
uh, his testimony, it was his testimony, testimony that, that, that put her, her in jail out. to begin uh, with. And then, yeah, he atones for that, atones by, getting for that by getting her out. Yeah, which but... Which is very problematic for me on many levels. Yeah, but exactly, mm. because then, you know, you see that this, like, love is actually based on his script for her, which is that she is this, you know, prim, innocent woman who has been victimised by her circumstances. Mm. And, he's, and he, as we said earlier, gets off on her suffering and her tales of mm. suffering. So he's doing the same thing. So this whole kind of idea of love is undermined. Yeah, and and, and I think also the degree to which, uh, you know, sort of the the idea of the enduring love, um, which is held up as as the I- ideal, you know, sort of that ideal in terms of uh, love between a man and a woman, mm. you know, in, in, in that way, um, has actually obfuscated in many respects the the, the very often problematic power relations yeah. of marriage and enduring love that are largely born by a woman, mm. that in actual fact the marriage contract, when thought of as a contract, mm. um, didn't. Because, you know, sort of when you try and wrest your way free of marriage because it's not working, there is overlying it, that not, that idea, well, that enduring love. Yeah. Whereas in actual fact, it, 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 the, the sort of the contract um, is at least, it's the house, it's the this, it's the, and it's that, the and that. that. And that narrative of enduring love and like that kind of romanticised vision of marriage as like this love match. Can actually be oppressive. Yeah. It, actually, it, can, utterly... it can be oppressive and it can also allow us to not look at the power relationships that exist within heterosexual relationships, yeah, especially it's at this ideal. point in time. Yeah, because it's, it's supposed to be the ideal. It's, it's yeah. what every, um, you know, sort of person is, and particularly, and it's still particularly, uh, I think, women who yeah, aspire that, that's what to you're that supposed lifelong, to be. Long, yeah. sort of, in, in, a, in a way that I don't think is the same well, for I, men. Look, <laughs> as a hopeless <laughs> romantic, uh, gonna... let me just uh, sort of comment on that. Um, I, I suppose, look, in terms of the story, the romantic storyline, Jamie wouldn't have been the hero that I would have picked uh, for that story. That was, for me, a surprise. That, that's one of the many surprises. I thought of all the men she ended up with, he wasn't the one that I would have hoped she would have ended up with. So... That wasn't quite the romantic storyline. It's a distorted. It is. It's a very distorted. It is. It's it's disturbing on so many levels. Yeah, yeah, it's wonderful. For me, that kind of reminded uh, me of a a different. I can't remember which book it was that I read now. I think it might have been The Men from the Boys, um, where this uh, Jewish guy went to Germany uh, and uh, this German guy slept with him because he had this uh, Nazi guilt or whatever it was. It was just one of the most disturbing things I've ever read in in a book. (laughs) And it kind of reminded me of that, this uh, idea of. Uh, sexual guilt almost or guilt that comes out of sexuality or whatever it was. It's a marvellous subversion of yeah, it is. love though, yeah. isn't but, it? Yeah, but, yeah, but for me the, the, the love story that should have um, been the romantic love story if it ever came about would have been her and Jeremiah. Yeah, see, I don't care about that. Yeah, see, well, well, <laughs> that's the part that I thought was being subverted more because of all yeah. the men that she met, he was the only one that she really asked to marry her. Yeah, I know, but see, I don't care about that because I didn't that like didn't bother me in the slightest, and I never even thought of a love story between her and Jeremiah. No, no, I, I, just I wasn't thought... thinking of a love story. It's just when Michelle was talking about love yeah, story yeah, there yeah, that, yeah. that I just sort of went to. I thought, well, if, if there was a love story that I would have attached to, it would have been that story. But that story sort of fizzled out and never really yeah, came about. See, what I think this is about, like, I don't think this is this is at all interested in in love at all. No, no. Um, not. and I think that like, had she gone down that path it would have cheapened the whole enterprise because I think that the point is that all of the men in this world, because of, of patriarchal systems, I suppose, um, are set up to view women in certain ways. And the love story of Jamie and, and Grace isn't a love story because it's so um, obviously constructed out of guilt and, mm. and, you know, he's imposing whatever weird view of women he has on her. And so for it to go down in Jeremiah, Grace viewpoint it's again another kind of um it would be papering over the kind of patriarchal structures as you were saying that are implicated in marriage implicated in that in that like romance narrative as a whole if you think of like the romance kind of um genre as like a meta narrative i suppose um so for me there was even though he he does kind of make an overture of marriage to her i never expected or hoped or thought about that as a kind of 
romantic well, he, story. Well, he made an overture of partnership rather than marriage. marriage she, yeah. she wanted the marriage. She wanted the marriage. She said yeah. he, she, he, she would only do if he marries her, and he said, no, yeah. I'm not going to marry you, but we will be equal in everything else. And she rejects that, which was quite interesting Yeah. for, for me. Um, because because well, she knows that she'd, she'd be ruined. Mm, she would be ruined. Yeah. Um, and, and that was part of the problem. In a way, he wanted a, uh, a system that their society didn't cater exactly for. exactly he um, wanted to her to go along with a system that would see her ruined mm. right and he like by traveling around with him not sanctioned by marriage mm. and she knows exactly what's going to happen mm. that's why i think she's the smartest i mean obviously she's the smartest person in the whole <laughs> buddy system you know like she knows what she's doing she always knows what she's doing and she's always playing the men around her and but they she is are still always victimized by by the system, though. Which, she's still victimised by very... the system, but she and she absolutely she's victimised by the system. Mm. She's victimised by all the men around her, but she's also playing them all in this very clever way that sees her end up with what she wants, which is freedom and a house and um, you know independence. But at the at the cost of having to put up with his drippy husband, who she has to feed <laughs> sob stories to, because that's the view of women that he has—that they're delicate flowers that he needs to rescue. Well, I think for me, the the, the cost was actually uh, everything she endured in prison and oh, leading yeah, up course. to that. And, and yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That for me was such a high price to yeah, pay. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and and that's the part that I, that I just kept—I can't get my head around, which is, you know, why wouldn't she have ended it sooner? Why would she just continue? Well, I think that what happened at the end is that it got away from her a little bit because of what happened yeah. to that, like, seance thing. Yeah. Um, and she was clearly playing on them and clearly manipulating them. And, like, to me, that... But anyway, it was a failed manipulation. It, 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 yeah, kind of. Case. Yeah, because... But she also gave the them the shock of their lives. Yeah, she did. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, she gave the, the society people mm. the story they wanted, but she didn't give the doctor... Yeah, the story who but she it. resisted their narrative. Their mm. narrative was just as damaging because their narrative is this like, oh, you're an innocent victim, you never did anything wrong. And mm. she, I think she resists that as well. Mm. I think she resists that, like, you know, your virtue in distress. Yeah, possibly because she did do something wrong, I suppose. In, well, yeah, but I don't think that is. Or it was also, <laughs> I guess, just that in given the moment, given the centre stage, given the yeah. circumstances, given the, you know, sort of the, the wildness of, 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 you know, sort of Mary Whitney yeah. loosed upon the room, um, th th there is that tantalising possibility, isn't there, that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a sort of a, 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 a drunk on the moment sort of yeah. ex explosion that, that, that is anger. irrational yeah. and, and not, you know, because I think that's the thing that you're seeing all the way through is that in order to spin the right story, um, you have to maintain your your wits your control. all the time yeah. and, and your control all the time. So what is that moment if perhaps not the, the explosion of, 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 you know, sort of... Um, of, of Unleashing of, all that anger and venom. That's why I loved that scene because I think that is the only time where female anger, which has been simmering the whole the whole series, is about this undercurrent of like female anger, and that's the only point where female anger is allowed to explode spectacularly. Mm -hmm. And even if it is, if you do take like absolutely, you could take a supernatural reading and say mm -hmm. this is the the you know the Mary Whitney spirit um, coming out and having her revenge. Isn't that fantastic that she gets this moment of like absolute you know you people are this is what you've done to me. This is where I am. I am so angry. And there's a price to be paid. Yeah, exactly. You know, and there has to be a price to be paid because of the society she's living in. Yeah. Um, and the price that she had to pay was an additional however many more years. Ten years, another, yeah. another <laughs> ten years in prison for that little... So and that in fact, that moment becomes... Moment of female anger. Yeah. yeah. But that becomes beautifully um, significant, doesn't yeah. it? Because what is the price for getting angry? Ten years. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> we stay, stay quiet. Stay, stay you know, quiet. Sort of stay trammeled. You know, yeah. sort of pretend um, to be this like virtuous, innocent woman at all times. Pretend to be stupid. If you have this moment of anger, you... be prepared. Ten yeah. years. Exactly. And, and that that is so often the case because you know, sort of angry women are so often punished for yeah. anger. So she's punished um, there are for consequences. being consequences. Exactly. She's punished for being silent. This is the catch twenty two that she finds herself in, that all women find themselves in. If she's silent She's punished. She's punished because nobody can get she her out of jail. That if she toes the line and she does what everybody tells her, she yeah. gets 
prison. Yeah. And if she breaks out, she gets another lot exactly, of prison. Exactly. But she also yeah. punishes another woman in power as well in the figure of Nancy. Yeah, but isn't that a way that isn't that a reflection of the way um, the patriarchy sets women up against each other? Against each other, yeah. To compete for men. Mm, yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting really, really virulent. Yeah, I know, I know. I know. I'm, I'm, like, I'm, I'm getting like, to you. I feel like he's backing I need to towards back the door. My the feminist door rant has. I think the feminist anger is coming out. I'm having I mean, a the only male here. Rage. If you're directing, directing but like, at me. Li- but there are limited resources in this in this society, right? <laughs> yes, you know, no, I completely agree with yeah. you. Know, I'm, for me, I was just more interested in the complexities of of, of the story itself because I'm, I I don't know how to take it uh, as a story, and you know, I do have a very um, I don't want to say black and white, but when it comes to ideas of justice, there's a part of me that just feels really, really passionate <laughs> about wanting justice to be served. Uh, and a story like this completely eludes ideas of justice. It's, it almost yeah. says, you know, there is not going to be any justice yeah. at all. And by the end of it, I'm just like, oh, I'm just not satisfied. I want justice. But you know what I love is a show and a book and uh, that does this, and Margaret Atwood does this in the book, and she mm. does, and the, the showmakers, Sarah Polly, who is a um, oh, Canadian fantastic. filmmaker. I yeah. absolutely love her. Yeah, yeah. She, she does this. She allows you to sit with that complexity and think mm. about it. And I don't think TV does that very often. I don't think film does that very often. I don't even think novels do this very often. Mm. It's just not give you any of the answers and not try to give you any of the answers and make you sit there and think about this. Or the only thing that you can, or, or the one answer that you do get is I think that, that wonderful idea you get sort of 10 years for silence and 10 yes, years for, for, range. For, 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 for rage. And how do you get out of that? Yeah. There is no way out of that. Yeah, and, and yeah. if there, that is that is a, a sort of that, if, if that's the idea that you can take forth out of all of that well, the way sort out of complexity. That was that uh, a man, in a way, set her free through his uh, mm. rec- recantation of, his, of you know, his testimony. Because that's the only way a woman can be set yeah, exactly, free, because he's believable. Yeah. yeah, and she's yeah. not. So, you know, and, and that's part that again so irritated me. what a glimpse me. into the world. Yeah, and that's <laughs> see, the other part that has... irritated me because I thought, you know, look, there goes my sense of justice again because in order for her to be free, she needs another man to rescue but her. But that's the way the world and, works. I know, and that's the yeah. part that, that angers me. I'm, and I'm yeah. like, I think oh. that's what she does is she mm. makes you understand what's at stake. Mm. But she has, in... well, you know, this is the part that drives me nuts. It's She had no agency in that. You know, she had a chance to actually participate in, in you know, freeing herself. But she destroys that chance uh, and then it's almost accidentally that that chance comes along without her own mm. uh, participation anyway he comes along and says look uh, I made a mistake so you know we're, we're going to free you because no way she would have gone because there's no other yeah. yeah there's no other way she could yeah. have gone to do that it, it required a man because a man's testimony is yeah. believable in a way a women isn't mm, yeah so, because we ascribe authority to men and we don't ascribe authority to women yeah but also because we're all human, and 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 so we don't do what's sensible. We're all implicated in the messiness of of, of living, and mm. and I guess you know it would have it would have yeah. never have seen See, as satisfyingly I know, unsatisfying I'm, I'm, I'm if she'd actually just I, gone I, I out. Because you know? <laughs> it would have only been show, half the story if she'd gotten out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, I mean, I mean, oh. I love messiness throughout the story, but by the end, I like a little bit of yeah, I like a little bit of order yeah. restore, and I felt that by the end of this story. There was no you know, restoration of order, yeah. exactly. and maybe that's the message at the that's end the that point. there can be yeah. no restoration of order. Uh, this under show these revels in its messiness, I think. Yeah, and you know, it just makes me want to you know, clean my hands <laughs> or something. You know, out, dance, out, I say. Yeah. <laughs> we only we have gone super over time. Yes, um, maybe we could just talk about like the show as a show, just for like oh. a minute, because I think it's beautifully filmed. I think it's beautifully acted. Um, mm. It's very intelligent. It doesn't give you everything kind of up front in a in the way that we kind of associate with with TV. What did you guys think of the show as a production? Oh, in terms of production, I mean Netflix have had this fantastic history of doing these mm. wonderfully you know produced show. It it could have just been a very long movie, you know, mm. as far as I can see. Um, the acting was superb. Yeah, the, wasn't it beautiful? Yeah, yeah. The, um, the cinematography, the the setting, everything was just absolutely fantastic. You know, I, mean, I lived in Canada for a year, so I was quite um, tickled when they were talking about certain streets that I remember <laughs> quite fondly. So they went Young Street, and I went, "That's Young Street. <laughs> Could that have possibly been Young yeah. Street?" You know, back then. And so I was interested from that perspective, and it did make me want to learn a little bit more about um, Canada's mm. uh, quite rich history as well. Mm. And I think you know, Atwood is very fascinated by mm. you know, uh, yeah. the history of Canada. Um. 
the actress who plays um, Grace, who I've just forgotten her name, Sarah Gaydon, Gaydon, um, I thought she was amazing in what she did with just her eyes. Mm. You know, she just changed, especially in that first monologue that opens the show where she's talking about all the different labels that men have put on her and she just, she becomes them mm. in like a shift of her eyes and a shift of her face. Mm. I thought the acting was really um, exemplary. Um, I thought this was an amazingly produced mm. and acted show. And the restraint in terms of, yeah. in terms of violence, you know, you know, so so it makes those moments of violence even more violent. There was exactly. That, I think there was that one image that I can't get out of my head now with the headless angels, you know, perching oh, on the tree. Oh, yes, yeah, my God. God. I thought that's I was going to have nightmares. nightmares. <laughs> that was me. But it never, it, it, but it never goes there too, too No, it doesn't often. go, yeah, yeah, exactly. It just gives you this glimpse and you know, they're going, oh. Yeah. <laughs> that's going to keep me up all <laughs> night. Yeah. yeah so absolutely. I think, you know, it's, it's a fantastically produced uh uh, show and it's, it's so smart like it it's is. it's smart in the way it's acted it's smart in the way it's written it's smart in the way it's 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 filmed i think it's just a really clever clever television show and very dark it always seems to be very cold there if you notice well it's Everything canada be, yeah yeah it is well yeah i do remember canada <laughs> it's yeah. very cold very damp oh that the moments on the on the ship i think i was had uh, yeah the people Come together, yeah. yeah. You know what? It made me kind of tired watching it, though, because (laughs) even though I loved it, no, 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 not because of anything that it did, but because she's constantly working. Because of that constant grind of housework. Did you, did you feel a desire I felt, to do No, no, something? no. I felt quite the opposite. I was like, just, you know, the, the, grinding, the grinding labor of their lives, like mm. the washing and the, oh. And, the, and I think that was intentional to, like, yeah. the women's work, women's labor, which is never ceasing. Mm. I think that was an intentional kind of effect. We have so completely run out of time that we're almost Way over comically time. over time. Um, so that was a fantastic discussion. Jimmy, I'm sorry if I scared you with my feminist rant. Yeah, I don't think you'll be back Feminist for a while, rant you know? is kind of my thing. <laughs> I'm just going to avoid stuff for a little while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just men. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Jimmy. You are, of course, yeah. lovely. Um, so thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Stephanie, for introducing me to Alias Grace, because otherwise I would never have seen it. So thank no you. No worries. Force me to watch anything you want. This is what happens when you give me a bit of power. (laughs) (laughs) Bit of agency. Yeah, a bit of agency and I go mental. Um, Thank you, Jimmy. (laughs) Thank you, Jimmy, for putting up with my feminist rants. Oh, no, always a pleasure. (laughs) Uh, So this has been another episode of From the Lighthouse. If you could please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, that would be very, 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 very helpful. Um, And thank you to all of those who have done already. If you have any feedback or suggestions, you can drop us a line at fromthelighthouse.org and we'll see you again in a week. Bye.